sunrise in the modern month of June, 1279 BC. This was the day that a dynamic young prince, 25 years old, was crowned Pharaoh of Egypt. This was Ramses II. It was the beginning of an extraordinary time for this ancient land. During his long reign, which spanned some 67 years, everything was accomplished on a grand scale. No other pharaoh constructed as many temples and monuments as he did. No other pharaoh fathered more children. So inspiring was the reign of Ramses II that the kings that followed in his footsteps called him the Great Ancestor. But history recalls this pharaoh as Ramses the Great. When Ramses II came to the throne, he was prepared for kingship as perhaps no other prince before him. His father, Seti I, had commanded victorious military campaigns and guided Egypt through a period that was unsurpassed in building and art. He was determined that his son would possess the education and military skills to ensure these traditions would continue once he had become pharaoh. As a boy, Prince Ramses rode alongside his experienced father in military campaigns in Libya and Syria. And because the hope of the new dynasty rested with him, the importance of producing heirs to perpetuate the royal family line was also impressed upon the prince. This was a royal task Ramses took on with a passion. It has been estimated that even before he became pharaoh, his two principal wives and the royal harem had already bore him more than 20 children. Egyptians married young. And so royal princes, before they came to the throne, would probably be married more or less as soon as it was feasible. And the idea would be that they would start producing children very soon. And there's really two reasons for that. One is, you know, it's no good having one prince. That prince simply may not survive long enough to become the next ruler, so you've got to have a number. But the other thing is, the royal house was a kind of image of fertility and productivity for the Egyptians. And so pharaohs and princes tried to produce a lot of children. Ramses recounted the details of his early life in an inscription at his father's temple at Abydos. The all-powerful Seti himself made me great while I was a child. He equipped me with women, a royal harem, and placed those of the north and the south under my feet. At the rock quarry of Aswan, Ramses had supervised the cutting of stone required to build his father's temples. Now that he was pharaoh, Ramses wasted no time in using the lessons he had learned then to erect monuments of his own. Ramses II was probably the first great master builder of the world. And he really built more probably than almost any other monarch in ancient history. In the southern frontier of the country, we have the temple at Luxor, which is a state temple to the god Amun. And he is the major builder in that temple. It was here, at the Temple of Luxor, that a huge festival was mounted in his honor two months after his coronation. As a symbol of his gratitude, he commissioned a new gateway, obelisks, and the first of many colossal statues of himself. This is the uh, upper part of an enormous statue of Ramses II that comes from a temple that he built at uh, Abydos in southern Egypt. This is a very fine example of the traditional representation of the pharaoh in ancient Egypt as a kind of uh, powerful adult male. And in this case, because the statue had been buried in the desert sand, it still retains a lot of its color and shows us how brightly colored Egyptian statuary and temples 
were, so that they really looked more like living entities than simply just stone-carved images. Under Ramses, the so-called hypostyle hall, started by Amenhotep III at the Temple of Karnak, was expanded and completed. Like all of the building projects of Ramses the Great, it is a marvel of ancient architecture. Its 134 columns form a veritable forest of stone, which once raised a ceiling to a height of 75 feet. But the building projects of Ramses II did not stop with the temples of Karnak and Luxor, which are located on the east bank of the Nile, at Thebes. In accordance with Egyptian religious dictates, Ramses erected his mortuary temple on the side of the river where the sun sets, along the west bank. It was called the Ramesseum. It was a massive complex. Its construction required the labor of 3,000 stone cutters. Although today much of it lies in ruin, an ancient traveler, Diodorus of Sicily, described it as surpassing all other temples of its time. To protect his temple, two 60-foot high granite statues of the pharaoh once stood here. The remains of one statue's upper torso and head still guards the site today. But it was at Egypt's southern border near modern Sudan that the pharaoh Ramses' grandest monument to himself is found. It dominates the landscape along the Nile and is called the Temple of Abu Simbel. Carved out of the site of a mountain, the grandeur of this great temple must have led ancient river travelers to believe they truly had entered a land ruled by gods. Experts believe that the construction of Abu Simbel began during the 10th year of Ramses II's reign in 1269 BC and took 13 years to complete. Although it was dedicated to the Egyptian gods Amen-Ra and Ptah, the enormous sandstone monument glorified the god King Ramses himself more than anything else. Four colossal likenesses of the pharaoh gaze out across the Nile from a facade that appears to have grown right out of the earth. They are commanding figures that reach a height of 65 feet if they could stand, these giants would be nearly a hundred feet tall. By comparison, religious symbols and representations of his queens, children, and relatives are dwarfed. Abu Simbel is a miracle of engineering. It is oriented so that on only two days of the year, during the spring and fall equinoxes, the rays of the rising sun will pierce the entranceway. The light then makes its way past eight 33-foot-high statues of the king portrayed as the god Osiris. Continuing along the 215-foot corridor, the sun's rays finally enter the most secret sanctuary of the temple. Here, the light illuminates the statues of three gods seated within. Not surprisingly, Ramses himself is among them. A fourth god, Ptah, is also represented, but not entirely in the light. Evidently, this is because Ptah is the Lord of Shadows. Adjacent to the site of Abu Simbel, Ramses the Great built a temple to honor his favorite wife, Nefertari. Its rock face features six statues of the king and queen, and has been interpreted as an amazing display of the king's affection. This was a great honor to be so closely associated with the pharaoh, and it is likely Queen Nefertari witnessed the dedication of her own temple at Abu Simbel. Nefertari died in 1254 BC, and as the principal wife of the pharaoh, Ramses had a tomb prepared for her in the Valley of the Queens, on the west side of the Nile, near Thebes. 
The tomb lies some 25 feet below ground level. Recently restored and open to the public, it represents one of the most beautiful examples of an ancient Egyptian royal tomb known to exist. Inside, Nefertari is portrayed on the walls in symbolic poses with the gods. Around the same time as the temple of Abu Simbel was being built, Ramses the Great began work on the new city called Per Ambusu, a name that means Domain of Ramses. Located in the northeast part of the Nile Delta, it has special significance. Hebrews had lived peacefully around the Nile Delta for 400 years, but concerned over their numbers, Ramses and his father before him may have forced them into the hard labor of constructing this new city. It is from here around the year 1263 BC that the story of the Exodus in the Bible probably took place. Ramses II is often associated with the Exodus. The details that are given about Egypt at the time, including naming a specific city, fit in with the later New Kingdom and the general period of Ramses II. Um, and we know that there were many, many peoples brought in for various reasons during that time. So I would say that it's basically a true story. It's recorded only in the Bible because it was an extremely important event in history of the Hebrews. It would have been a minor event to the Egyptians of the day. Whether or not he was the great pharaoh of the Bible, there is little question that Ramses' vast building projects left no corner of Egypt without a reminder of his omnipotence. By erecting so many monuments to himself, Ramses raised his image to the status of a god. But Ramses the Great's fame was not based solely on the monuments he built. He is also remembered for the enemies he crushed. Ancient Egypt. In a civilization that endured longer than any other, one man stands out among its leaders. He fathered more children and erected more monuments than any other pharaoh. Even his accomplishments on the field of battle remain some of Egypt's most celebrated. During his 67-year reign, Ramses II led foreign conquests that brought a flood of riches into Egypt and spurred a cultural boom. New monuments and additions to temples were paid for with tributes to Ramses and by the spoils of war. The labor was provided by slaves he captured in battle. Northeast of ancient Egypt lay a vast desert frontier that is now modern Syria. Ramses' father, Seti I, had maintained control over the southern coastal regions of this land. However, a people known as the Hittites held sway in the outer areas and in a strategic city called Kadesh. During the fourth year of the reign of Ramses the Great, a revolt took place in the Egyptian-occupied area. Ramses was determined to retain the land his father had won for Egypt and used the opportunity to oust his enemies, the Hittites, from their stronghold once and for all. To accomplish this, Ramses would face his greatest test. It is remembered as the Battle of Kadesh. The ancient inscriptions tell us that in 1275 BC, Ramses assembled one of the greatest forces of Egyptian troops ever seen. He led his army of 20,000 men up the Gaza Strip toward Kadesh. Close to his destination, two Hittite spies were captured, but they misled Ramses by saying the enemy was fearful and 100 miles to the north. Confident 
Ramses moved ahead with only one quarter of his force and then set up camp to wait for the remainder of his army. By the time he learned the formidable Hittites were actually lying in ambush, it was too late. Miraculously, Ramses did manage to hold off the enemy long enough to allow Egyptian reinforcements to arrive. A complete rout was avoided, but most experts believe the Battle of Kadesh ended in stalemate. It is apparent, however, the Pharaoh didn't see it that way. Ramses' tales of his triumphs at Kadesh are inscribed on the walls of the temples at Karnak, Luxor, Abydos, the Ramesseum, and inside Abu Simbel. It is celebrated as one of the greatest military victories in ancient Egyptian history. But did it really happen that way? One of the most interesting sets of historical documents we have from the reign of Ramses II is uh, the series of representations and inscriptions describing uh, the Battle of Kadesh, this great battle uh, in which Ramses portrays himself as defeating uh, the Hittites uh, at the site of Kadesh in uh, Syria. Uh, the actual outcome of the battle, however, appears to have been more of a stalemate, and it's one in which the Egyptians did not come out looking very victorious. Campaigns against the Hittites continued in later years, Ramses finally realized he could not hold the far reaches of Syria. In what some believe is the first peace treaty in history, the two countries agreed in 1259 BC to a non-aggression pact of mutual support. Carved in clay and stone, both Hittite and Egyptian versions of the document survive to this day. Once peace had been secured, Ramses II married a Hittite princess to cement the treaty. His harem eventually grew to include royal ladies from Syria and Babylon. Ramses II died in 1212 BC. Records tell us he was 92 years old. After the mummification process, his body was wrapped in golden shrouds and fine linen, placed in a stone sarcophagus, and entombed near his ancestors in the Valley of the Kings. Despite all the provisions to ensure an everlasting afterlife, over the next 200 years, his burial site was repeatedly plundered by tomb robbers. Priests had to rewrap and move his mummy to other tombs to keep it whole. His final resting place was a simple cedar coffin. In 1881 AD, Ramsey's mummy was found hidden away with the other mummies of the royal cache at Dar el Bahari near Queen Hatshepsut's temple. Analysis of his mummified remains revealed him to have had red hair and a height of about five foot six. His aquiline nose had been well preserved because his embalmer stuffed it with peppercorns. The inability for Ramses to find peace after death was symbolic of what lay ahead for Egypt. The country was beginning a long and fitful decline. It is believed Ramses the Great sired over 200 children, of which more than 100 reached adulthood. The first 12 sons in the line of succession died before their father. The 13th would become Pharaoh. His name was Merneptah. Because his father had reached the astounding age of 92, Merneptah was in his 60s by the time he became ruler. Although he did wage successful military campaigns against the Libyans and Nubians, his 10-year reign was too short for him to equal Ramses' achievements. Still, the discovery of a portion of Meneptah's palace at Memphis was a great archaeological find. 
no other remains of a pharaoh's residence have ever been unearthed. Pieces from the complex and a scale model of a section of the ancient residence can be seen at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology. They reveal the grace and beauty of the colorful surroundings that the great Egyptian rulers called home. The incised carvings on these actual fragments from the palace depict the pharaoh in symbolic royal poses. On this fragment, uh, we have depicted uh, Merneptah standing in front of the creator god, Atum, this figure on the right. And Atum is conferring the crook and flail, the symbols of kingship, upon Merneptah, who's represented here with the Atef crown and holding this Rechyet bird, a lapwing bird, which symbolizes the people of Egypt. Hieroglyphic inscriptions on the palace gateway describe accompanying scenes depicting Merneptah's link to the gods and power as Pharaoh. The text reads, granting to you the crook and flail and millions of years of rule. Uh, so this is a very condensed and very nice statement on the uh, divine interaction of the king and the way uh, his kingship was conferred upon him uh, by the gods. The glorious high watermarks of the 19th dynasty pharaohs were history by the time Merneptah died in 1202 BC. But the story of the greatest pharaohs did not end there. Before it would draw to a close, the name Ramses was heard across nations and represented the might of Egypt one more time. And a queen called Cleopatra became the center of a drama that captivated the world. Below the foothills of the mountains which conceal the Valley of the Kings stands a mortuary temple at a site called Medinet Habu. It is the best preserved of all the temples of the ancient city of Thebes and the only one in Egypt where the existing hieroglyphs, reliefs, and architectural layout have been completely documented and translated. Its builder was Ramses III, the second pharaoh of the 20th dynasty, who took power in the year 1182 BC. His connection to Ramses the Great was in name only. They did not descend from the same bloodline. Ramses III inherited a stable Egypt, a nation at relative peace. But eight years into his reign, he would be compelled to face an enemy that would put his world in turmoil. Around the year 1176 BC, the ancient nations along the eastern Mediterranean, in areas known today as Turkey, Syria, and Israel, were threatened by a wave of humanity, armed and aggressive. These invaders were collectively and curiously known as the Sea Peoples. During the reign of Ramses III, um, from his mortuary temple at uh, Medina Tabu, we have one of the longest historical texts from pharaonic history which is the depiction of the, the invasion and defeat of the Sea Peoples. This invasion appears to have been not only a sea invasion, but also to have taken place on land. The Sea Peoples were not just armies. They were nations on the move, including women and children seeking lands to settle. The gravity of the threat to Egypt was magnified by the fact the Sea Peoples were even able to overrun Egypt's traditionally powerful rivals, the Hittites. Ramses III realized the urgency of his situation. He ordered his outposts to stand firm at all costs while he rapidly mobilized and marched an army northeast to turn back the invaders. The first of two battles with the Sea Peoples took place on land near the Syrian border of Egypt. Ramses' victory was decisive, but he still had to confront their navy. Evidence suggests the navy of the Sea Peoples was formidable. 
Still, paintings on the walls of Ramses' temples depict his archers bravely firing countless arrows from the shore and from ships into the enemy's ranks. It was clearly a major effort involving a lot of very exotic people with whom the Egyptians were not very familiar in terms of their military organization or their fighting capabilities. So it was really one of the great military success stories of, of ancient Egypt. Despite his glorious victory, Ramses III was forced to put down yet another invasion three years later. This time, it was staged on Egypt's western border by an alliance of different tribes, including the Libyans. After winning the battles here, scribes proceeded to count the enemy dead. This was accomplished by cutting off their right hands, which were brought before the pharaoh and tallied. In one case, Ramses III ordered a recount. This time, in a gruesome display of spite, the enemy's phalluses were severed. Ramses III had once again saved the nation, but then, in an ironic twist of fate, an assassination attempt was made upon his life. We actually have the records of the official inquiry, which was set up to inquire into his assassination. And there's a certain amount of debate as to whether it was an attempted assassination and he survived, or whether it was successful, and this is the aftermath. The instigator of the plot to kill the king was a secondary queen named Tai. Some believe that the motive for the crime was Tai's disappointment that her son would never ascend to the throne. There were simply too many others in line before him. Her plan may have been to kill Ramses so that her side of the family could usurp the normal line of succession and seize control of Egypt. But it seems one of the conspirators had second thoughts and let the secret out. The trials involved more than 40 conspirators. After being found guilty, six of the condemned committed suicide in the court. They died in sight of all those present. Their alternative would have been a slow and painful public death on a sharp impaling rod. Others found guilty of lesser involvement had their ears and noses cut off. Whether or not the assassination attempt was successful, it is certain Ramses died before the verdicts were handed down. The shameful end to his 31-year reign foreshadowed troubled and chaotic times for Egypt. After Ramses III and his successors, you get this period of uh, political breakup and social stress. There are still Egyptian pharaohs, but they seem to be much less in control of the situation. Uh, you have the country itself dividing up into several kingdoms with several pharaohs ruling at the same time. Scholars suggest that Egypt was failing for yet another reason. Egypt is no longer confined to the narrow, safe valley of the Nile. There are other great empires rising, not least, of course, over in Assyria. And we're into the last thousand years BC. So the whole thing is a state of flux. So Egypt is no longer top of the pile, top dog, and she is suffering. Over the next 800 years, nearly 70 rulers from 11 new dynasties would govern Egypt. They included Libyan, Nubian, Syrian, and Persian conquerors. Egypt was under the domination of the Persians when in the year 333 BC, they were compelled to face one of the most formidable military commanders in history, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was the son of King Philip II of Macedonia, who had become the dominant power in Greece at the time. Educated by the Greek philosopher Aristotle, young Alexander rose to power in 336 BC, after his father was assassinated. 
He immediately turned his attention to the task of defeating the Persians who had threatened Greece for over 200 years. The Greeks fought their way southward until finally at the age of 25, Alexander decisively defeated the king of Persia, coercing the king's forces to flee occupied Egypt. Shortly thereafter, Alexander entered Egypt as its liberator. He met no resistance and was promptly crowned pharaoh and became a god. Alexander was a highly intelligent individual. And in no country is his political acumen more concretely displayed than in Egypt. Certainly to his troops, while he was, of course, a king and a great warrior, and a great man, he was not a god. However, he and his advisors were intelligent enough to see that if he was going to be able to control Egypt, he would have to assume the mantle of the Egyptian kings and be worshiped as a divinity. Although Alexander was now Pharaoh of Egypt, his destiny lay elsewhere. Shortly after founding the city of Alexandria and naming it the capital of Egypt, he continued to conquer foreign lands as far away as India. In 323 BC, however, Alexander, the survivor of many wounds, died of fever in Babylon. His empire, the largest the world had ever seen, was divided amongst his generals. Chief among them was his boyhood friend, Ptolemy. When Ptolemy laid claim to Egypt, it marked the beginning of the last Egyptian dynasty, a dynasty that would found the greatest institution of learning ever seen, build one of the seven wonders of the world, and produce the most famous queen in history. Hidden beneath the harbor of the ancient city of Alexandria are clues to mysteries that have gone unsolved for over 2,000 years. Rulers of empires once strolled along these paths. Submerged by an earthquake and only recently uncovered, these ruins provide us with a glimpse into the world of ancient Egyptian royalty. Here lie the remains of the palace of Cleopatra. The final chapter in the story of the greatest pharaohs began in the year 323 BC. It was in that year, Alexander the Great's general, Ptolemy I, laid claim to Egypt Later, he crowned himself pharaoh and became the first king of the 32nd dynasty, the Egyptian dynasty of the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies were a fairly successful line of Egyptian pharaohs in the sense that they maintained a, uh, a prosperous country through most of the period of their rule. Uh, they maintained a traditional religion as well as practicing Greek religion. Uh, there are lots of temples in which the walls are covered with traditional images of Ptolemaic rulers. So it is the last great phase of Egyptian kingship, actually, and it's not an inglorious ending. Like the great pharaohs before them, the Ptolemies were builders. They are best remembered for their monument to learning, the Alexandria Library. Hundreds of thousands of written works were stored there, but it was more than a library. It was the literary and scientific seat of its time. The first place in history where scholars from every corner of the known world and every field of study congregated for the sole purpose of seeking knowledge. The Ptolemies also built the lighthouse of Alexandria similar in design to the smaller lighthouse which they also built. It was the last of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The great lighthouse once stood at the site of this citadel and rose 400 feet above the harbor. Its beacon, 
was created by huge fires that were visible to sailors more than 100 miles out to sea. Despite early successes, family rivalries, political strife, and economic decline began to weaken the Ptolemies. Eventually, the ever-increasing power of Rome determined the fortunes of Egypt. By the middle of the last century BC, the Ptolemies were rulers of Egypt in name only. Julius Caesar held the real power over the land of the Nile. In the year 51 BC, Ptolemy XII willed the throne of Egypt to his 18-year-old daughter, the seventh Ptolemy to be named Cleopatra. But she was forced to share the throne equally with her 10-year-old brother, Ptolemy XIII. Cleopatra was born in 69 BC. She spoke seven languages and was the only one of the Greek pharaohs capable of speaking Egyptian. Contrary to popular mythology, Cleopatra was not physically beautiful. It is said, however, that she possessed exceptional intelligence, charm, and a beautiful voice. The great philosopher Plutarch once wrote, it was a delight merely to hear the sound of her voice, with which, like an instrument of many strings, she could pass from one language to another, so that in her interviews with barbarians, she seldom required an interpreter. Cleopatra used and needed all of her talents to maintain control of her beloved Egypt. Not long after taking the throne, Differences between Cleopatra and her brother resulted in outright civil war. Some experts argue that the Alexandria Library was destroyed in the conflict. Cleopatra was forced to flee briefly to Syria, but returned to Alexandria upon hearing that Julius Caesar had arrived there from Rome. She realized with the growing power of Rome in the Mediterranean world that there was very little hope of her maintaining her status as queen of Egypt. So much so when Julius Caesar came to Egypt, as we all well know from the many plays and scenarios written subsequently, she beguiled him. Wrapped in a carpet, Cleopatra's servants smuggled the queen into Alexandria and carried her up to Caesar's quarters. The carpet was presented as a gift, and when it was rolled out, the queen of Egypt was revealed. Caesar was enchanted, and Cleopatra gained the ally she needed. Defeated, her brother Ptolemy XIII mysteriously drowned. Caesar returned to Rome only weeks later, leaving Cleopatra pregnant with his son, Caesarion. But after a year had passed, he requested her presence. Cleopatra's appearance in Rome was an outrage, and combined with Caesar's feuds with the Roman Senate, led to his assassination in 44 BC. Cleopatra returned to Egypt while the power vacuum left by Caesar's death was being filled by his great-grandnephew Octavian and one of Caesar's former consuls, Mark Antony. But their joint rule proved to be unworkable, and Mark Antony began to look to Egypt and Cleopatra for support. When Antony and Cleopatra met, her charm and ability to discuss subjects reserved for men captivated yet another Roman general. It was the beginning of a love affair and a political alliance that would determine both of their fates and the fate of Egypt. Although Antony did return to Rome in an attempt to mend his differences with Octavian, the trip was unsuccessful and he rejoined Cleopatra for good. Whatever he may have wanted from her personally and emotionally, he also wanted money, timber for his ships, and she wanted 
further grants of territory, uh, further political guarantees. They were always allies as much as they were lovers. Mark Antony was committed to Cleopatra and the two children she had bore him. He proclaimed that Caesarion, her son by Julius Caesar, was the legitimate heir to the leadership of Rome and presented Cleopatra with gifts of Roman land. We have the situation of a noble Roman, a great Roman general, at one point giving away parts of the Roman Empire to an Eastern queen, and that was not to be tolerated by the Senate in Rome. That's why Mark Antony was declared public enemy number one. Manipulating these feelings to his benefit, Octavian obtained the backing of the Roman army and declared war on Antony and Cleopatra. The forces of Octavian met the navy of Antony and Cleopatra at the Sea Battle of Actium in 31 BC. The Romans succeeded in surrounding the Egyptian fleet and the day belonged to Octavian. Seeing defeat, Cleopatra and Antony made their escape. Within a year, the Roman fleet entered Alexandria's harbor and the Egyptian forces surrendered. Mark Antony knew what his fate would be, and he took the noble Roman way out. He fell upon his sword and committed suicide. Cleopatra knew what her fate would be. Golden chains on her wrists and ankles in a great triumph in Rome. She couldn't beguile Octavian as she had been so successful with Mark Antony and with Julius Caesar. Octavian intended to be master of the Roman world. Ancient sources tell us Antony died in Cleopatra's arms. She too was prepared to die by her own hand. Cleopatra gave orders to have a poisonous snake brought secretly to her. With her servants in attendance, the serpent coiled around her arm and executed a fatal bite. Cleopatra was 39 years old. It may not have been such a, a bad kind of death. It was actually a, a fairly normal form of capital punishment in Egypt at the time. So Cleopatra would have, have known what it was like to die this way. The moment Cleopatra took her last breath, the age of the pharaohs was over. It was a fitting end to one of the greatest love stories of all time and for the ancient Egypt civilization that lasted longer than any other. It is true that Egyptian Roman overlords continued Egyptian ritual, appeared as pharaohs and built temples to the gods. But these actions were purely for the purpose of maintaining control over the population. In reality, Egypt was just another territory, a rich land to be drained of its resources for the benefit of Rome. Unattended, the shrines and monuments built over a period of three millennia were forgotten. What wasn't defaced or looted lay helpless against the relentless wind and sand. Their colors were erased and their forms buried beneath the surface of the desert. Now the voices of the god kings were silent. The Egypt of the pharaohs, the old civilization, the great empire of the Nile had come to an end. But after all attempts by man and nature to destroy what the ancients had built, the legacy of the kings and queens of Egypt has survived. Their faces testify to the ageless glory of human nature and reveal how little it has changed since the time of the god kings the giants, the greatest pharaohs.